Well, hello, everybody. My name is Nate. If we haven't met, and I'm just I'm thrilled that we get to be together. Everybody um, joining in different places. Thanks so much for tuning in too. So we're in a series where we've been looking at the book of John, which is one of the four books that chronicle the life of Jesus. And John's very unique in many, many ways. And then he uses this literary device um, using the number seven where he has seven moments where Jesus makes a self-declaration about who he is, which is wonderful because Everybody's wondering who's God and what's, what's God like. And so Jesus says seven times, I am. And then John says there's, he records seven different miraculous events. And he says these events, he calls them signs most of the time in the book. And they're signs to help people believe that Jesus wasn't just a good man or a prophet, but signs that he was actually God come to planet earth. And so we're going to look at, I think it's a fourth sign. And this is from John chapter seven. Last week, we looked at Jesus healing a man who had been unable to walk for 38 years. And Jesus says, get up and, and then acknowledges that he has a deeper problem. Now, this miracle, I, I, it's just, I've, al- I've always loved this text because it, it's great for anybody who faces overwhelming situations, which is everybody. And if you're not facing one now, I think you will in the future. Situations where you see a need and the need is massive. It may be personal, maybe something at a global level, and you're just, that's so wrong, and that needs to be changed. And then you immediately say, but what in the world can I do about it, right? And if I don't have a solution, typically we move towards cynicism or disappointment. And this is a situation where Jesus is going to walk one guy in particular named Philip. He's one of his disciples. And he's going to help Philip realize that the impossible is within the realm of possibility. All right. As long as Jesus is involved. Now, one of the, um, one of the things that would be helpful for us to know is that after Jesus heals this guy that we looked at last week who hasn't been able to walk, um, the religious leaders, are, are, they're just incredibly infuriated at Jesus. One, because he healed on the Sabbath, that was their sacred day, and he told a man to carry his mat. But two, because in chapter five, verse 18, okay? I just wanna read this because it's gonna give us a hint at what is happening in Jesus' uh, context. They, they are incredibly frustrated because Jesus has made himself equal to God. And they, they were admirers, but in 518, we read this. For this reason, they, meaning the religious leaders, tried all the more to kill him. So they're so infuriated that they want to kill Jesus. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. And so now this movement against Jesus has begun. Because Jesus is saying this, I'm not just a good man. And that's why he keeps doing these signs. He wants to shake people's understanding and help them consider that he's more than just a religious leader, that he's actually the son of God. Now on the screen, I want to show you a picture that will give you a little bit of an idea where this is taking place. So this is the Sea of Galilee. It's the north end. This would be taken from the eastern side. And Sea of Galilee It's 13 miles long, it's seven miles wide, at its widest, it's shaped like an upside down pear. And it would have been somewhere in this region right here where this miracle takes place. It's a very serene place. Um, All the hills kind of move up from Galilee, creates natural amphitheaters, because we're gonna talk about a crowd of thousands. All right, let's read together from John chapter six, verse one. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, somewhere really close to where we just saw. That is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, why did this sea have two names? Well, in the first century BC, one of the Jewish uh, sub-kings decided to gift the second emperor of Rome, Tiberius, decided to gift him the sea, so he named a city Tiberius after Emperor Tiberius, and he renamed the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberius, after the emperor. This is a wonderful gift you can give someone someday. And a great crowd of people followed him. Why are they following? Because they saw the signs 
he had performed by healing the sick. They're just in awe. Like who in the world has control over biology? Who can make things that are broken well? They're just amazed. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. So he's attempting to get away just with his disciples and the Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, notice this, he dresses just one of his 12 disciples. Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have just a bite, just a bite, half a year's wages. Take an average salary, cut it in half. You're like, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars just for everybody to have a little bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. I love that John records the word small. Like, if you don't know, this is an impossible situation. They're not like big barley loaves and big fish. They're like, they're small. This is going to take a miracle. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. So in first century Jewish culture, When you counted crowds, you only counted men, right? Sorry, ladies. And so it's very possible that there were 15,000 people present. Um, We don't know exactly. But 5,000 men and however many women and children were there, this this is a really big crowd. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet. So Hebrew mentality had this concept that there would be a return of Elijah, one of the famous Old Testament prophets found in the book of 1 Kings primarily. And uh, this, this prophet would make the way for their promised Messiah. This is the prophet who has come into the world. Next slide, please. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again into, uh, again to a mountain by himself. So the people like, th- this is a good king, right? He, he, can, he can feed us. We don't have to work anymore. You just give him a couple of little barley loaves and fish and he can, he can take care of the nation. So they have an agenda for Jesus that Jesus does not have for himself. Like they want, they want political power. They want to overthrow Roman governments. They want to get rid of Herod. And Jesus says, no, 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 that's, that's not what's going to happen. So he escapes this crowd f- trying to force him to be a king. So what do we learn from this text? A couple of things. Number one, number one, I say this. When you're facing overwhelming realities, always let Jesus establish the need. Let Jesus establish the need. What do I mean by that? I want you to put yourself there for a moment. They've, they've climbed up on a hillside and Jesus had just performed some miracles on the other side of the lake. And so people have traveled, thousands of people have traveled around the lake and Jesus and his disciples see this massive crowd. I mean, tens of thousands coming up the hillside and the east side of the Lake of Galilee is really barren. Nobody lived there. So there's, there's just no resources. And Jesus points out one disciple and he says, hey, Philip, how are we going to feed these people? How, how are we going to feed these people? Here, here's what I love about this. I, um, I sometimes think I know what needs to be done. 
right? I think, hey, somebody needs to do something about this. Somebody needs to do something about that. This has to change. This is unright. This is not righteous. This is wrong. This is broken. This oppression needs to stop. But when it's my idea, I'll never have adequate resources. But when it's Jesus's idea, that introduces the opportunity for something miraculous. And here's what I'd say. I think Jesus is still using people's names and asking them about a need. Hey, hey Nate, what are we going to do about? And I think what I'd love for you to do is put your name in there. Each and every one of us. There's some massive overwhelming need, something that just, it's something that you've always been drawn to. It's something that's unrighteous. This could be kids who don't have homes. This could be uh, somebody needs to pray about. Somebody needs to support missionaries. Somebody needs to get involved in government and make a difference. Somebody needs to enter the business sector with a whole different way of thinking. Somebody needs to, and you know what I think is happening? I think Jesus is saying, <clears throat> hey, What are we gonna do about this? And you hear Jesus calling your name and identifying a need. And I want you to notice something really important about that sentence. Jesus uses the plural. What are we going to do about? He does not say, what are you going to do about? But that's what Philip heard. Philip heard, you're asking me, I don't know what I'm going to do about that. But Jesus will always say, I want to do a miracle. But Jesus does miracles through partnership. And he'll say, what are we? So um, one of the unique things about the role I get to play is people come to me with their passions, right? And probably every week, I love people come and they're like, hey, Now you've done research and something in your heart is stirred and you're like, hey, this is wrong. This is unjust. And here's what they tend to ask me. What are you, Nate, going to do about this? What is the church going to do about this situation? And I never mind when that question is asked because I know what's happening. The dynamic we just read about. Jesus called your name. And he said, hey, what are we going to do? And you think, well, I don't know. But I'd like, I'd like my church to do something about it. That's quite all right. But here's what, here's what I believe Jesus is always going to do. He's going to say, oh, no, 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 no. I, I was talking to you, Philip. I was talking to you. And I, and I said, we. I said, I'll be involved, I'll do something with you. So what we have is people who become passionate about all different types of things. And and that's a beautiful thing, but we have to realize that Jesus said different things to different people. And and so some of you have heard, hey, what are we gonna do about a billion people on planet earth who have no access to the message of Jesus? Some of you, like Jesus said that and you're like, I don't know, what are we going to do? And Jesus is asking you. He's asking you, like, are you going to support? What are we going to do? Um, About the fact that in my old hometown, there's no church and I've got family members. Here's what Jesus is saying. Hey, what are we going to do about planting a church in Wolf Point? And you're like, I don't know, but Nate will figure it out. Nope. Because when Christianity is at its best, is when people hear Jesus put something on their heart and he says, let's do something about this. And I think, okay, Lord, I don't know how, I don't even know if it's possible, but you put something on my heart and I can't shake it and I'm not going to pass it off to someone else. I'll allow the answer to be yes. Yes. I don't know what we're going to do about hungry people. I don't know what we're going to do about injustice or human trafficking. I don't know what we're going to do about kids these days. I don't, but I heard you say it, Jesus, so I'm in. 
I am in. Here's the second thing. So like let Jesus establish the need. What is he calling? What is he saying to you specifically? Secondly would be this. We all have a choice. Will we be Philip or Andrew? Philip or Andrew? So you have, we don't know what the other 10 disciples did, but we know these two. So when Jesus asked that question, Philip, what are we going to do? Philip, he's a practical guy. Like, this is me. I see a need. I feel Jesus is stirring. And I, I automatically go to, like, I calculate things. I do a balance sheet. I'm like, okay, thousands of people, absolutely nowhere, tons of resources. Look at all those hungry faces. Like, we don't have a prayer. But there's this other guy named Andrew. Now, I don't know. I wish I knew what was behind this. But maybe Andrew just had this sense that this Jesus I'm dealing with, he could take something small. And he could do something miraculous. And so somehow Andrew had an interaction with this little boy. And this little boy said, hey, uh, I've got five little barley loaves and two fish. And Andrew says, maybe, maybe we could do something with this. So there's two equations that are happening here. Here's the two equations. <coughs> Philip's equation is this. The resources needed, half a year's wages, plus available resources <laughs> equals a huge deficit. This is, this is a completely natural way of thinking, right? This, this is how we typically process things. Andrew has a different equation. And there's just one addition that changes everything. Resources available. He sees five small loaves and two small fish, the number of people, the, the massive need. But here's what he adds. But we've got Jesus. And if we've got Jesus, maybe he could do something with these two small fish and these five small loaves. I didn't, I didn't bring two fresh fish, but I brought sardines. I thought <laughs> this might keep the room from smelling weird. Andrew looks at the same crowds that Philip looks at. He looks at all the hungry faces. And he says, Jesus, what could you do with this? This is all I found. Whenever there's some sort of need, there's some sort of opportunity that God's stirring your heart with, Jesus will say, let's do something about this. And you always have to take inventory. And, and here's what I guarantee. When you take inventory, there will never be enough. If you feel moved to stop poverty, if you feel a deep move to address what's happening in your neighborhood, to, to deal with crime. I was just talking to somebody and I was so proud of them. They were worked up about uh, drugs and what's happening in our society. And man, it was like, Nate, you gotta fix this. And I looked at them and I said, this is an impossible situation, but Jesus is asking you to get involved. Give him the little bit you have. You take your small amount of resources, which is woefully inadequate. You take your little tiny bit of courage. You take your, your hope. You take your passion. And you give it to Jesus. You say, I'm overwhelmed. But I'm putting this in your hands, Jesus. And would you do something and I'm willing to be a part of the solution. Rather than being an outside cynic, rather than being critical, rather than looking around saying, somebody should do something about this. Because I'll always look at this, whatever you have, and I'll say, hey, there's not enough. Too short, too late. There's no way this is gonna happen. It's too far gone, too expensive. It's too overwhelming. And Jesus says, that's okay. That's okay. The important thing is you give Jesus something to work with. Here's the third thing. This, this is absolutely pivotal. Is you got to put it in the hands of Jesus. Right? 
Because in my hands, this is all I've got. The hands of Jesus, you've just put whatever that resource is into the hands of the God who multiplies. And Jesus takes it and he blesses it. Uh, the other gospels that record the story says he also breaks it. Then he gives it back to his disciples. He says, I want you to hand this out to the crowds. Remember, Jesus had everybody sit down. So he hands this to the crowds. And the, the only difference is this. It, it's still the same amount, but it's been in the hands of Jesus. And with something that's been in the hands of Jesus, there's the potential for something miraculous to occur. He puts it back in our hands. And he says, now you do something. I've touched it. I've blessed it. Here, here's the, the fourth point. This is, this is where you need courage. You have to walk towards the crowd. You walk toward the need. You walk toward the challenge. Because here's what I would want. I would want Jesus, okay, Jesus, I put this in your hands and here's what I want you to do. I want you to create a massive pile of bread and fish. Just, just a huge, massive pile. That's not the way it operates, is it? He hands it back to the disciples, what seems to be the exact same resources. And imagine there's 15,000 people there and you're given like, hey, you go feed those 3,000 people with this. Can you imagine walking towards 3,000 people like, uh, guys hungry? Because, let me see, I'll do some quick math. I'll, you'll get one. Let me see that. There's enough for you. <laughs> and like, how about that for you? Um, we're going to need one of those cannons for the balcony. <laughs> Just tiny, like, how about, oh, young lady, this is for you. It's delicious. <laughs> right? That, like, like, when does the miracle happen? The miracle happens when you walk towards the crowd and you go, well, I got this much. There you go. And you look back in your hand. Hey, I still have this much. <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of a bad throw. And you look back in your hand, I still have the same amount. The miracle, John wants us to know this. We've seen this in, in sign after sign or miracle after miracle, that the miracle happens in that act of obedience as you walk towards that intimidating, hungry crowd, as you walk towards that challenge that Jesus has laid deep into your heart. You move towards it with just what obviously isn't enough, but you choose a route of generosity, a route of trust. You choose to begin to believe if I give this away, Jesus touched it. So there's gonna be more. If I give away all the love, if, I, if I, I'm generous with all my resources, if, if I pour my passion into this, the trust issue is this, I won't be empty. Instead, the great multiplier, Jesus, will increase what I just gave away. And I'm not operating from a sense of scarcity and afraid that there won't be enough. I, I'm like, I don't know. Jesus asked me to do this, so I'll, I'll try it. I'll try it. I'll trust that he can multiply whatever it is I have. Th these miracles work in this way. By the way, this is a really unique miracle. One of the reasons that Jesus is trying to help them understand that he's more than a prophet is this. Is he goes, you got to know that God has returned to planet earth. And one of the things that God did throughout the Old Testament, especially during the Exodus, these 40 years where the people have left Egypt and their slavery and they've wandered, is for 40 years God fed them. He fed them. And they learned trust. And they learned that God's a multiplier. And they learned that God doesn't run out. He fed them with this supernatural food called manna, a Hebrew word manna. If you translate it into English, it literally means what is it? Because they're hungry in the desert and one day they wake up and God says, I'll, I'll feed you. They wake up, open their tent flaps and there's this, this bread-like substance all over the ground and they go, what is it? And that's manna. 
And for 40 years, they collect it and they eat it and God sustains them. And now Jesus is feeding people. There's a miracle in 1 Kings chapter 17. There's a prophet by the name of Elijah and there's a devastating famine in the land. There's a, a widow, she has a son and she's just at the complete end of her rope. And Elijah shows up to her village and says, ma'am, um, I'm hungry. Would you make me a loaf of bread? And here's her answer. This is a single mom. I have enough oil and flour to make one more loaf of bread to feed me and my child. And after that, we're going to die. And Elijah says, what if you made that one loaf of bread and gave it to me? And I told you that God would do a miracle. She just doesn't have much to lose, right? There's one more meal for her and her son or feed this prophet. So she does it. She takes everything, empties the jars, makes one loaf of bread, gives it to Elijah, goes back to her jars. Guess how much is there? Doesn't say the jar was filled. There was enough for one more day. And this happens for two years. There's enough for one more day. That's the way God's miracles happen. Instead of what we want, right? And you'll, you'll, you'll hear people talk about this, even Christian teachers. Is you give God, you step out in faith, and he gives you a pile. I rarely find that to happen in my life. I find this. He gives me what I need for one more day. He multiplies. Yeah, I emptied myself. I've got no resources left. But God says, oh, no, check. See what's there tomorrow. You keep handing out what you've got and look back in your hands like, how did that get there? It's the miracle of the multiplier. Several years ago, this is probably 25 years ago, I, um, I took a trip to East Africa. I'd never been there before. It was Uganda. And um, it was right at the... Boy, there's just the devastating reality of the AIDS crisis. And it, it was a really tough time in East Africa. First day I got there, I just was unable to sleep because the time changes. And I'm in this little village, a little guest house. And uh, I decided to get up. It's probably one in the morning. And I start walking through this village. And I hear a bunch of noise at the end of the street. And I go down. And there's this little open air restaurant. And uh, a little black and white TV hung from the ceiling. It's about this big. It was the World Cup, right? So for most North Americans, you're like, eh, right? But for the rest of the world, it's like, ah, right? And so I, I go, and it was just, I had so much fun. I am the only non-African sitting in this little place. And we're watching a fuzzy rendition of the World Cup and everybody's cheering. After a little while, I noticed across the restaurant, there was another, another guy who looked North American to me. And so we started to talk. And I found out, I just asked him some questions. He was, he moved there some four years before working with the Peace Corps. And uh, I said, well, what brought you to Africa? And he said, like, I saw the need. I, I saw the HIV crisis, the hunger, the malnutrition. He said, I gave up everything to come here. He's been working for four years. And as we talked throughout that night, I'm not, my heart just broke for this guy. He had given everything. And yet, he was so frustrated, depleted, exhausted, and cynical. Because he, like, I've given everything, and he just felt like he hadn't moved the needle. He's trying this impossible task of reversing some damaging realities within a culture. And it's like everything I've done, I feel like I don't get anywhere. And like, not kidding, he was one of the most frustrated people I've ever met, one of the most despondent people I've ever met. And at the end of our conversation, I said, hey, can I pray for you? And he said, no. I said, that's okay, that's okay. Walked away, finally made it to bed. Next morning, we're driving down a road headed towards a, a rural village. And up ahead, there's this guy walking down the side of a road. And um, obviously he's not African. And so we pull over and it's like, hey, do, do you need a ride somewhere? He goes, absolutely. Never forget, this guy's name was Paul. 
And so we're like in a, the back of a, a four wheel drive truck with like six too many people and everybody's sitting on each other's laps. And he comes in and sits right next to me. We're really touching. And I go, so what, like, what are you doing? He goes, ah, oh, my family and I, five kids, we moved here 10 years ago. God called us. We, 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 we came to Uganda. We've been here. And he was just like passionate. I said, why were you walking? He said, well, God told me to head to this village, but when I got up, I realized I didn't have any gas in my truck and I had no money to get gas. So I just started to walk and I figured Jesus would see me and send a ride. <laughs> I'm like, man, you're sure chipper about this. <laughs> and for these next two and a half hours, he just tells me his story. He's been here 10 years. He's so passionate. He's so filled with hope and, and, and vibrancy and it, excitement for what God is doing. And this whole trip, I can't help but compare these two men. Two men who both had a passion to see the world change, to tackle an overwhelming situation. One was despondent and empty. The other was full of life and passion. And I realized it's this dynamic that we're talking about. Paul, the missionary, he, he said, Jesus, I'll, I'll move to Africa and I'll give away everything I have. And here's what I know. I know that we are doing this together. You called my name, but you didn't leave me here to do it by myself. And so I'm just putting everything into your hands and you hand it back and I give it away. And I turn the next day and I, I give it away. And I still have hope and I still have passion and I still believe that you can. And my other friend, Jesus wasn't a part of the equation. And he was giving and giving and giving and I commend him for that. I'm moved by his dedication but he had given away everything that he had. And there was no multiplication in that equation. I, I, I think of um, just some normal people in this community. I, I think of this group of young adults that decided that the Muslim world closed access countries, that somehow, some way, this group of people from Billings, Montana, a fairly insignificant city in the scope of things, they said, hey, Jesus called our name. And they began to tell people and they began training and preparation. Some of you guys heard Jesus call your name and you said, hey, we'll help support you. And they, they've, they've gone there. And there's two of them in particular, four of them in particular in a nation, I can't even give you the name, but it hasn't had a Christian church in over seven centuries. And they've got a group of 30 covert, undercover believers who meet together a different place, a different time every single week. It's the first time there have been a group of people from this nation worshiping Jesus in a group in 700 years. What did they do? Like, who in the world can get their way to the Middle East? They just said, I don't know, Jesus, but this is what we've got and we're gonna give it to you. I think of, uh, there's a family called the Higgs. And they came to me years ago. They, they were like, they were just devastated by a report they heard on human trafficking and they began to research it more and more. And they, they came to me and they said, this is the statistics, these are the statistics. This is what is happening in our area here in the nation. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I just didn't know it was that bad. And they said, this is a big problem. And this involves all kinds of complicated issues as you can imagine. But they said, we're gonna walk towards that crowd. And today they've got a home where women who have been mistreated and abused and have said, I want a way out. They can hide away and go through restoration and healing and training so that there can be a different, a whole different path ahead of them. I, I think of, uh, man, you would know the Kennedys. Jesus called the Kennedys' name. He said, hey, somebody needs to do something. 
about kids who don't have homes in this area. And Kennedy said, all right, Jesus. And Jesus said, yeah, we can do something about this. And they've got foster kids and teaching people how to be foster families and doing Haven camp. And they did, just did a, a, an incredible ski trip for kids who are in foster care. What is that? That's just people who are saying, I, I don't know, but I'll walk towards that crowd. I'll walk towards that impossible situation if indeed Jesus is the multiplier. So here's my hope. Jesus calls your name. Maybe, maybe it's something in your family. Maybe it's in your neighborhood. Maybe it's a big cultural issue. Maybe it's a global issue. But he says, Philip, what are we going to do about this? And make a decision. Will you be Philip or will you be Andrew? Philip will say, I, I don't know. So much, too much, too expensive, too many people, too many issues, too many logistical challenges. And Andrew says, well, I don't know what we're supposed to do, but I got this. And let Jesus take whatever it is you have, put in his hands, let him give it back to you. And then head towards the challenge. Don't cower. Don't wait. Don't wait for there to be an abundance of resources. Go towards the challenge with what you have, with that little bit of courage, with that little bit of hope, with that little bit of resources. Because Jesus is the multiplier. Will you pray with me? Lord, Every day, we're going to face overwhelming, challenging situations. Some of them at personal scales. They're within our own lives, our own fears and anxieties. Some of them are massive. And Lord, this is what I pray. I pray that we would hear Jesus call our name and say, what are we going to do about this? because I can't do anything. None of us can do anything, but we, <laughs> if Jesus is a part of the equation, the impossible can happen. And so we give you the little bit that we have and with the, with the miraculous hands of Jesus, bless and break and multiply what we have and then we move out, we move towards the challenge. We refuse to be the cynics who sit back we move towards the problem because Jesus is involved, because the equation is always we. If you keep your eyes closed for one moment, I also want to make space and room for anybody, and you just say this, I am ready to surrender my life to Jesus. I cannot save myself. I can't be good enough. I need a savior. I turn to him. I follow him. I'm not asking if you just want to believe, but are you ready to surrender yourself to Jesus? If that's you, would you just raise your hand and wave at me? I want to make eye contact with you. Yeah, I love that. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you're his. Yes, yes, yes. If you're in the balcony, will you wave at me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. If you're online, the Lord sees you. Oh, amen. Hey, would you applaud for a bunch of people that just made a really, really bold decision? So everybody, thanks so much. Um, man, think about that. What is Jesus calling your name to do? If you need prayer, there's people up front you can trust. If you raise your hand, I've got a Bible for you. It's free at the Welcome Center. If you're a guest, we have a, a, a gift for you as well. Otherwise, go and be the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of Jesus. Let him do something miraculous through our lives. God bless you. You're loved.